Praise be to God. Praise God. Psalm 29. Psalm 29. And who told you that? Lord, open our ears, eyes, and heart to receive with understanding in Jesus' name. Who told you that, man? Hallelujah. Psalm 29. The word says, Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty ones. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in a beauty of holiness. Now listen, look at verse 3. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them also skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian, like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness like Kadash. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth. The stripes and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everyone says, glory. The Lord sat enthroned at the flood, and the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. So we see that all of this is a representation of the voice of the Lord. Now, the voice of the Lord is powerful, isn't it? Now, it comes in certain ways to us. Sometimes God speaks to us. Number one, he speaks to us through a still, small voice within us. Now, we may call it a still, small voice, and some parts of it we call it a consciousness. Amen? And sometimes he'll speak to us in a circumstance because what happens is we usually get into a circumstance because we missed what he was telling us. Amen? Amen? He'll speak to us through dreams and visions, through his word, through prophecy, through word of knowledge, and through word of wisdom. But most of the time, he's speaking to us, right in us, trying to guide us. Does everybody understand that? Amen. Okay. Now, there are more... The one voice is out there, isn't there? Amen. If you've ever said, Lord, speak to me, now, next thing you know, there's like a gazillion voices trying to speak to you. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> now let's go to Ephesians 6.12. Hallelujah. Ephesians 6.12. We need to lay a little foundation here so we get an understanding. <laughs> Who told you that? In the book of Ephesians, in chapter 6, in verse 12, and it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So we're not fighting flesh and blood, are we? So when a voice comes to you to rebel against something, what voice is that? Amen. The voice of the stranger. So you have a choice, don't you? Let me tell you something. The devil is not going to come up to you and say, Hi, I'm the devil. And he's not going to come up to you in the voice of, Hi, I'm the devil. I, know I want you to serve me and I want you to do this. That's not how he works. Does everybody understand that? He's going to speak to you because within me and you is a speaker. Does everybody get it? That same voice that we always hear, that we always say, well, that must be me, is because there's a speaker in us. And this is the best example I can give. And out of that speaker, just like in a radio or a stereo system, you can take the tuner and tune in all stations, can't you? But it still comes out of one speaker, doesn't it? So within me and you, that's why we always think that it's our thoughts. Does everybody understand that? But those thoughts can either be from the devil or God. And you must discern it, even though it sounds like the same voice. Is everybody with me? Amen. Okay. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 10. Hallelujah. Remember the first rule. God never interrupts himself. That's how you know who you're listening to. Does everybody understand that? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Let me give you an example. When the Lord calls us to worship and praise him, that doesn't mean you pull out your Bible and begin to read. You know, we do a lot of ministry in the jail. And when the Lord said, calls us to praise and worship Him, you'll find guys that, instead of standing up and worshiping the Lord, they'll pull out their Bible. 
Let me tell you something. They think that God is speaking to them and that's not God. They're listening to the voice of the stranger because the Lord never interrupts Himself. Never. If He's asking you to do something and you're not willing to and because you believe that what you're doing is right, that's not God. And the Bible says, submit to God, then you can resist the devil. In other words, submit to the authority of God and the ways of God or you will not be able to submit the devil. Does everybody understand that? And the devil knows that. That's why many people go back and yield to the devil in an everyday circumstance, not willing to submit to the authority of God, not willing to submit to the voice of God, not willing to submit to His will. You will never submit to His will. You'll never fulfill His will until you're ready to submit to all that He has. Does everybody understand? Because what you do then is you give, one, uh, you give an open door to the devil. If you give him one slight open door, he's in there. Because if he can convince you on one thing, he can convince you on big things. And it just gets worse, bigger and bigger. And the Bible says, one plants, one waters, and God gives the increase. Well, let me tell you something. When the devil plants that seed, he waters it and he gives the increase. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, you're rebellious with one thing. And you become rebellious with more things. And you'll find yourself right back where you came from. Amen? Amen? Right back in bondage again. Right back serving the devil again and not even knowing it. All because of one little seed that was planted by him. Amen? In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Amen? So you're walking in the carnal doesn't mean that your war is carnal. Does everybody understand that? In other words, we're walking in the natural realm. In other words, somebody upsets you or whatever. The old man had a tendency to want to fight in the flesh or get revenge. But that doesn't do any good. Because what you're doing is just feeding those demons then. Amen. Amen? Amen? Because your fight and my fight is not natural or carnal. It's not fleshly. Does everybody get that? Amen. No, let's go on. Verse 4, For our, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. And that's what's happening. These strongholds are taking hold of us. Old habits, old ways, fruits of ungodly spirits, unclean spirits. In verse 5, he tells us, Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Now, where do those things that occur? In your mind. Amen? In your mind. Bringing every thought into captivity into the obedience of Christ. So whose responsibility is it to bring those thoughts into obedience? Amen. Our, this is where we got to check ourselves out. Are we doing it? Am I taking those thoughts, the voice of the stranger, that's telling me to do it my way instead of God's way? You know, we cry out for God to help. And He brings us to a place to get help. Yet we still want to do it our way. He puts us in churches, puts us in fellowships, rescues us over and over and over. Yet we still believe, well, I'm comfortable doing it a certain way. Man, it's soulish. That ain't spirit. That's soulish. That's what God needs to rip from you. Your comfort zone. If you're still relying on comfort, you're deceived. Because you better start relying on truth, not comfort. Amen? Praise God. And verse 6. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do you understand that you will not have any victory until your obedience is fulfilled? Because that's known as submitting to God, then resisting the devil. If you don't have obedience, if you're not obedient and submitting to God, you will never defeat the powers of darkness. You will constantly have a fight and a struggle, be sucked into the soulish realm, serving the flesh and serving the devil. Why? Because of comfort, feeling. Does everybody get it? It's so important. Praise God. Hallelujah. Joshua 5. It's right next to Judges. Joshua. In chapter 5. Remember, God says, My people are destroyed for what? Lack of knowledge. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. We need to learn this stuff. Remember, it's not about condemnation. It's about learning truth. And if you get convicted by the Holy Spirit, praise God, you can repent and do the right thing. Make that choice. Hallelujah. And Joshua chapter 5. Let's start with verse 1. 
Josh, Joshua chapter 5 and verse 1. Praise God. Anybody got a page number for somebody here? Uh, 151. Okay. Joshua 5 and verse 1. So it was when all the kings of the Amorites were on the west side of the Jordan, and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we have crossed over, that their heart melted, and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. In other words, they feared because they heard what God had done. Everybody understand that? All that the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives for yourselves and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. So Joshua made flint knives from himself and circumcised the sons of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war, had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. For all the people who came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness on the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness to all the people who were men of war who came out of Egypt were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord to whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord had sworn to their fathers that he would give us a land flowing with milk and honey. Then Joshua circumcised their sons whom he raised up in their place, for they, were uns for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And so it was when they had finished circumcising all the people that they stayed in their places in the camp till they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. Many didn't obey the voice of the Lord and never made it to the promised land. By not obeying God's voice, promises of God will not be able to be manifest in your life. Does everybody understand that? Why? Because the devil is trying to lead you astray and remove you out of divine position where the promise of God promises of God can't manifest in your life. Do you understand that? Now we know that the word is a representation of the voice of the Lord and his voice that dwells within us is a representation of the voice of the Lord. Does everybody understand that? It is important. The devil wants to remove you from position, from receiving from God. There's a divine position for every promise. Amen? There's a divine position for all the promises of God for me and you. To God be the glory. Go to Romans 8. Hallelujah. In Romans chapter 8. All the promises of God. Divine positioning. We'll talk. We, we got another teaching about divine positioning, but we want to get through this today. You're in divine positioning right now. Amen? Amen. Divine positioning receives promises of God. Romans 8, 5. Is everybody there? Amen. Romans 8, 5. You know, God is faithful to complete what He started. But you know what? Who wants to go through it kicking and screaming? <laughs> and keep missing the promises of God? Man, I'd rather just do it. In Romans 8, 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their what? Minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, that lets you know where you're at. Where are your thoughts at? Where is your mind at? Is it wanting to serve the Lord? Is it wanting to expand the kingdom of God and bring glory to the name of Jesus? Is it wanting to be obedient and submission unto God? Where is your mind at? Is there communion in you with the Holy Spirit? If your mind is still on the things of the outside world, then you know that you're carnal. Hello? Amen. For to be carnally minded is death. To stay carnally minded will bring separation between you and God. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Your carnal mind hates the things of God. Enmity means hatred. It hates the things of God. That's why rebellion kicks in, doesn't it? Man, you know what? Did you ever hear people go, man, you know what? God just 
God didn't do it. He didn't fulfill it. God, you know, why are you always doing this to me, Lord? Why is it always me? Let me that's the carnal mind who's coming against the ways of God. And everyone has a carnal mind in them. The carnal mind does not die. It must be renewed. Does everybody understand that? It doesn't die. You must take dominion over it. Because the carnal mind is empty against God for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. Hello. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead also will give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom you cry out, Abba, Father. Let me tell you something. When you are baptized in the Holy Spirit and you have fellowship with the Spirit of God, you'll know Him as Daddy. You don't just know Him as God. You'll know Him as Daddy. You don't know Him just as Lord and as Jesus the Christ. You'll know Him as Daddy. And that's what God is trying to bring us to, the position of knowing Him as Daddy, a father-son relationship. Amen? Amen? Praise be to God. Let's go to Numbers. Numbers 13. Hallelujah. Numbers 13. The book of Numbers. Praise be to God. In Numbers 13... And verse 27. Hallelujah. Now we're going to see, there's a couple examples of who people were listening to. Amen? In Numbers 13 and verse 27, the place was called the Valley of Eshcol because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down there, a cluster of grapes. Okay? And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadash. They brought back word to them and all to the congregation, showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruits. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amaleks dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome them. Amen? But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than us. Hmm. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone are sp are as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight and we were in their sight. Now listen, some of them were ready to take the land. They didn't care what these men looked like, how big or whatever. Why? They were going in the name of the Lord. And the other ones that were there were caught up in the natural realm being concerned by what they see. Does everybody understand that? Let's go a little further. Hallelujah. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, if, and if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. You know what? Some people 
the voice because they're listening to the voice of the strangers are going, man, I should have, I should go back to where I came from. I was better off over there. I was better off on the street serving the devil. I was better off in jail. I was better off. Why? Because God is dealing with them now. Amen. Man, I was better off doing this. I was better off doing that. Well, that ain't true. Who are they listening to? The devil. The voice of the stranger. Amen. So what, what, what happened? They began to what? Complain. Complain and grumble. Complain and grumble. Now, verse 3. Now what did they start doing? Remember the carnal mind? <laughs> Remember the carnal mind we talked about as enmity against God? Listen. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? Oh, man, it sounds like the carnal mind in activating, activation. So they said to one another, let us select the leader and return to Egypt. Oh, man, they were getting ready to go back to the bondage of the devil because they had listened to the voice of the stranger. Hello. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephani, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Now they were putting their trust in the Lord. Only do not rebel against the Lord, hello, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. <laughs> now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the meeting before all the children of Israel. Now God had to step in. Amen. But now check this out, man. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Sometimes you'll even convince your brothers as you begin to grumble and complain. Next thing you know, your brother will get involved. Yeah, man, why? Why is this? Why is that? You know, the devil wants to take you out and stone you. I mean, who do you think told them to stone them? The devil convinced them to complain and rebel against God. Now he's convincing them to kill them. Does everybody understand that? All because they listened to the voice of the stranger. And I want you to understand something that Caleb and Joshua were the two originals that made it to the promised land. And this is caused, why? One of the events is they trusted in the Lord and didn't grumble and complain in the wilderness. They were willing to do whatever it took. They, they, yes, of the originals. Because even Moses didn't get to the promised land. Amen? Does everybody understand that? It's so important that we get there. Hallelujah. Let's go to 1 Timothy 4.1. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. In other words, who told them that? <laughs> who told them that? 1 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Praise be to God. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, and I'd like us all to read this together. This is so important. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Everybody there? Let's read this together. Now the Spirit expressly says, now, if He expressly says, He's overemphasizing, He's like writing it in neon letters. He's saying, listen, listen, listen. You must understand this. The Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. Are we in the latter times? Amen. You bet your... Amen. <laughs> We're in the latter times. Now, some are going to depart from what? The faith, aren't they? Amen. They're going to walk away from Jesus. Isn't He representation of the faith? Some are going to depart from the faith. You know what? We've departed from the faith at one time or another, haven't we? Amen. 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 Some are going to depart from the faith and continue to depart from the faith. Now, he's going to tell us why. Is everybody with me? Let's read it. Giving heed to deceiving spirits. Now, what does giving heed mean? Listening. To listen to deceiving spirits. Now, what are these deceiving spirits? They're known as unclean spirits, familiar spirits, deceiving, seducing demons. That's what they are. They're demons. Amen? Amen? And doctrines of what? Demons. Why? They're going to bring you into their theology. Does everybody understand that? They're going to try and convince you, but you must understand the first thing he says is 
You're, they're going to listen to them. Amen? They're going to listen to them. How are they going to listen to them? In their mind. In other words, that voice is going to come to them. Look at if they're deceiving spirits, that means that they're unknown. They're hidden. Hello? Hello. So something that's deceiving doesn't reveal itself, does it? It comes unknown. Does everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. So that voice that you're listening to, that you, that is your voice, that you know it so well, when it says to you, come on, um, you can do this one more time. That don't worry about it. You don't have to submit to this. You're all right. Mm -hmm. Well, what voice do you think that is? Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. What's he trying to do? Lead you astray. Why? Because he wants to stone you and kill you. <laughs> He wants you to get out of divine position so you can't receive the things of God. Does everybody get this? Praise God. Praise be to God. Now, let's go to a, a couple other samples here which are powerful. Now, um, <laughs> let's go to uh, 1 Kings 18. 1 Kings 18. I want to bring some examples of the deceiving spirit. 1 Kings chapter 18. Hallelujah. 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 25. Thank you, Lord, for revealing truth to us. Thank you, Lord, for discernment. Thank you, Lord. 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 25. Is everybody with me? Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one bull for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many. And call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them, and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning till noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. Now Baal represents Satan. Mm -hmm. But there was no voice, no one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry a louder, for he, for he is a god. Either he is meditating or he is busy. <laughs> Maybe he's on vacation. Or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud and cut themselves. Hello. Cut themselves. Mm. It's part of piercing, too. As were their custom with knives and lances until the blood gushed out of them. And when midday was passed, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice, no answer, no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him and he, rep and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord had come saying Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he made a, a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seas of seed. And he put the, word, the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood and said fill four water pots with water and pour it in the in the burnt offering, pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. Then he said, "Do it a second time," and they did it a second time. And he said, "Do it a third time," and they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, "Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel." Let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, and hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord... He is God, the Lord. He is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and executed them. Now, I want you to understand that 400 prophets of Baal were executed that day. 
Elijah just called fire down from heaven. Amen? And he showed King Ahab, who was married to Jezebel, that the true God of Israel was the Lord. Amen? Now listen. Ahab goes home to tell his wife. Now listen to this. In verse 1 in chapter 19. And Ahab told Jezebel that Elijah had, what had Elijah had done. Also how he executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as a life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Bathsheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Now check this out. Elijah just got done calling down fire from heaven. Just killed 400 prophets. He receives a message written to him that Jezebel is going to kill him. Hello. And he boogies. He runs. Leaves his servant and runs. Why didn't he stay? Because he believed the message, didn't he? He listened to the voice of the stranger. Now, he was just listening to God a, a little while ago, right? Killed 400 prophets. Does everybody understand? And how quickly, wham, you can go. How quickly that voice can move you right out of position. Does everybody understand that? Come on, I want to show you a couple other examples. Amen. Who told him that, right? <laughs> Elijah believed the voice of the stranger. And the demons that were in um, Jezebel are known as strangers. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise be to God. Second Samuel 11. Is everybody all right? Are you getting it? Hallelujah. I think we're getting it today. Amen. Man, we've been listening to the voice of the stranger occasionally trying to lead us out and push us out of position to receive. Well, he's a liar. Remember, he's known as the father of lies, isn't he? <laughs> Praise God. And 2 Samuel chapter 11. Okay, hold off on that for one second. Okay, we'll get to the question. But make sure you write it down so we can get to it. 2 Samuel chapter 11, in verse 1 and 2. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle. So all the kings would go out to battle, right? that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, Rah uh, Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Now, who told David to remain at Jerusalem when all the kings were supposed to go out and fight? The stranger. The, stranger, the voice of the stranger. Does everybody get that? Now listen. In verse 2, Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. Um, from the roof, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. David fell into fornication, and it prevented David from building the house of God because he killed Jezebel's, I mean, um, uh, Bathsheba's, yeah, Bathsheba, Bathsheba's husband. Does everybody understand that? So here, Satan, the voice of the stranger, convinced David not to go out to war. By convincing him not to go out to war, hello, he fell into fornication. Does everybody get that? Do you understand that he moved him out of divine position and put him in his position to cause him to fall? Does everybody get that? That is so important because that's what the devil wants to do to me and you. He wants to move us out of position to cause us to fall. Amen? Praise God. Now, <clears throat> let's go to... Uh, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 3. Now when the tempter, who's the tempter? Yeah. Satan. Came to him Jesus. What did he do? He said. Does everybody understand it? Mm -hmm. If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. So if, if Satan tempted Jesus with his voice, do you think he'll tempt me and you with his voice? <laughs> Amen. Of course he's going to tempt us with his voice. So we got to understand it, and he's going to come back at a prime, any prime opportunity he can. Does everybody understand that? Listen, the devil works this way. When he causes you to get down or stumble or be bummed out, be oppressed, offended, woe is me, he comes in with the harpoons now. He, he removes the little darts and the little seeds. 
because he's trying to wipe you out. So when we start going, woe is me, he comes in with the harpoons. When we start going, oh Lord, why me? Why this? Why that? He's, manifest, he's allowing you to manifest the carnal mind. Now he starts shooting the harpoons and he starts reminding you of all of the things that he's going to try and convince you that God was not there for you. But he was. Amen? Amen. He's going to try and tell you all of these things and move you out of position so that you don't receive the things of God. Amen? Amen. And to God be the glory. Let's go to a couple more examples. Luke 22. Now remember, if Satan tempted Jesus with a voice, he's going to tempt me and you with a voice. In Luke chapter 22. In Luke 22, in verse... Let's see here. Hallelujah. Verse 31. Luke 22 and verse 31. And this is Jesus speaking. And it said, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has what? Asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. So he knew that what? Satan was asking to sift. So I want you to understand that Satan's voice is active. Amen? And what does he want to do? Sift me and you. He wants to sift me and you. Does everybody understand that? His job is to kill us. His job is to wipe us out. You're on the hit list of Satan. I like that example. <laughs> I, like, I like that example. We just had a question of how, you know, like our flesh. Well, how did I desire my flesh? What our eyes, what our ears, and what our, what our feelings are. Well, we must understand that it's a voice. The desire of the flesh, even though that there's a desire of the flesh, a voice still tells us the desire. When we look at something, a voice still tells us what we're looking at. Amen? When we hear something, when we feel something, a voice still tells us that. Just like what we were just talking about, a computer. The only way that something can come up on the monitor is if it's typed in. Amen? And we better know who's doing the typing. That's where you and I must have the discernment. And there are ways to know. One way is you'll tell the voice by its fruits. What is going to be the outcome? If you're truly having fellowship with the Holy Spirit, He's going to tell you things to come, isn't He? When you hear that voice, the Holy Spirit's going to remind you of what the outcome of that is going to be. If you're listening, you won't do it. You'll know by the fruits of the voice. You'll know that God never interrupts Himself. Does everybody understand? When we were out using, and we were clean for two days, and we had that, um, while we were out using, we had that unction, come on, come on. Come home. Come on. Get cleaned up. Come on. We can work this out. Come on. We know that it was the Lord. And then that other voice, which was still out of the same speaker, which we thought it was our own thoughts, amen, was saying, oh, one more time. One more. Come on. You can get a job tomorrow. You can do labor pool. You can do this. They'll forgive you. You can lie your way out of this. And you're thinking about how you're going to lie. In fact, when we got high, the next thing we were thinking about is when we were going to run out and how we were going to get the money Amen. to supply it. When we even had enough money and dope with us. Why? Because the voice of the stranger was already leading you, keeping you in his position. Amen? He was doing the typing. <laughs> and we were doing the doing. <laughs> Does everybody understand that? So yes, your flesh has desires. Your soul has desires. The, the feelings. When you got a feeling, it was the devil that told you you got a feeling. Hello? Those feelings are either from God or from the devil. Hatred is a representation of a feeling, isn't it? Jealousy is a representation of feeling. Now, we carry a fallen nature, don't we? Our flesh is a sinful nature. And if we're led by the Spirit, it'll be crucified. But it's our responsibility to discern the fruits of of that voice, whether it's of God or whether it isn't. Remember, you and I were created out of choice. Amen? Amen? Weren't we created out of choice? We were created out of love. So if we were created out of choice, that means you and I have the choice to make a choice. And you and I sit in the chair. If we were to look at us, you, our spirit sits in this temple. And there's two reservoirs. One reservoir is feeding us from the Lord. The other is from the devil. In other words, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is still in me and you. It's not been removed. 
That's our flesh. Now we have the tree of life, right? Now the devil's tr still trying to convince us from eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, isn't he? And the Lord is saying, come on, eat of the tree of life so you can maintain life. That's why those who are led by the Spirit have life. And those who are led by the flesh have death. Amen? Amen. So he's trying to get you to eat something. And you must eat something every single day. You must eat something. So we want to eat the fruits of the Spirit. We want to eat the fruit of the tree of life, not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because the devil is trying to move us out of position. Amen? Amen, amen? Praise God. Now, let's go to a couple other things. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Hallelujah. Is everybody all right? Amen. Glory to God. So we understand that it's our responsibility to have the discernment, isn't it? Praise God. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 13. Is everybody there? For such as false prophets, prophets or false apostles, I'm sorry. For such as false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. Hmm. Hmm. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of what? Light. Light. So let me share this with you. Remember I shared with you that Paul warned us that many would preach the same gospel but a different Jesus. Why? Because their interpretation, hello, is some of their interpretations is incorrect, which transforms themselves into what? A false apostle, right? Those who do not preach that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, now don't get me wrong, they're not telling the whole truth, are they? No. So that's known as the spirit of error, isn't it? Now, are they doing it on purpose? No. They believe that this is true. Does everybody understand it? They believe that all the gifts and all the things were at that period of time. They take scriptures out of context. They do not interpret them correctly because they do not have fellowship with the Holy Spirit who brings truth through His Word. Does everybody understand it? That's why He's known as the Spirit of Truth. Now, are they doing it because they want to deceive people? No. They're doing it because they truly believe but in reality and truth, they're listening to the voice of the stranger. They are taking heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Why? Because the devil does not want people to have the power of God. Does everybody get that? Now, I'm not coming against denominations or whatever. I'm revealing truth because there is deception involved there. Amen? And it's so important. Now, let's go on to verse um, 15. Therefore... It is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Now, you know that they won't be able to hold on to righteousness too much longer, will they? Amen. And it can only last so long. Praise be to God. So we just completed, what was that, Second Corinthians 11, uh, 13, and 14, and 15. Hallelujah. Now, I want to show another example in Matthew 16. Hallelujah. Matthew 16. So from, from now on, you can start walking around going, who told me that? Who told me that? Who told me that? <laughs> and Matthew chapter 16. Hallelujah. In verse 15. And Jesus was talking to his disciples and asked them, who do they say that I am? Amen. And then he, 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 and, and he said to them in verse 15, but who do you say that I am? Amen? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen? Amen. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So he, who did he hear from? from the Lord. Amen. He heard from the Spirit, didn't he? Does everybody get it? Amen. He had revelation knowledge, didn't he? Through the Spirit of God. So he knew that he heard from God. Now go to verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Hello. 
You are an offense to me, for you are mindful of the thing. You are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. Now, wait a minute. Just two minutes ago, Peter gets a revelation from the Lord, from the Spirit of God, and says, "You're the Christ." And then two minutes later, Jesus is rebuking him. Why? Because he took heed of the voice of the stranger. Does everybody understand that? Do you see how quickly that can be? Now, God does not interrupt himself, does he? Was Satan trying to interrupt God by what he was saying? Does everybody understand that? So God does not interrupt himself, does he? Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's go to Mark 14. Mark 14. Oh, praise be to God. Mark chapter 14 and verse 10. I want to show you something else. Taking heed of the voice of the stranger. Who told you that? Mark 14 and verse 10. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray him, Jesus, to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. Well, we know that he what? Heard from the voice of the stranger, didn't he? Or else he wouldn't have gone there. So Judas hears from the voice of Satan, doesn't he? Amen? Now turn to Luke 22. Luke 22. Judas hears, in other words, Satan shoots the arrow or the dart, doesn't he? Now when we talk about Satan, we're not talking about him as an individual. We're talking about his kingdom. Does everybody understand that? We're talking about his kingdom. Satan does not possess people. Ang fallen angels or angels of darkness don't possess people. Demons do. Does everybody understand that? Demons are disembodied spirits. So when we talk about Satan entering or Satan speaking, it was a demon. Just like Jesus' name is representation of the kingdom of light, Satan's name is a representation of kingdom of darkness. Does everybody understand that? Because Satan cannot be in more, in more than one place at one time, can he? He can't be in many places at one time. Okay. So in Luke 22, I mean, uh, yeah, Luke 22 and verse 3. Is everybody there? Amen. Okay. Now remember, Judas just heard from Satan and he went to go betray Jesus, didn't he? He heard from the voice of the stranger. In verse 3, it says, Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. Let me share this with you. When Satan, the voice of the stranger, plants that seed, Hello? We obey it. It gives him full right to enter us. Does everybody understand that? Does everybody understand that? You mean a demon can enter me? Yes. Even though I'm, believe, I'm a believer and they have the Holy Spirit? Yes. And we'll go into all of this teaching later. Yes, he can. Does everybody understand that? When, you know, uh, and let me, let's go to Ephesians 6. Just I want to show you something quick. Ephesians 6. I mean, there might be a spirit in me even now? Yes. In other words, he may be dormant and he only wants to be activated at a certain time. Amen. Hello? Amen. Rebellion. Let me tell you something. If you're rebellious and you're going to fight and rebel, there's a demon there. Amen. And he needs to go. Why? Because a rebellious demon is a representation of the spirit of Antichrist. Hello? Amen. Okay. In Ephesians 6. Is everybody there? In verse 10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to what? Stand against the wiles of the devil. In other words, that's the trickery. And in verse 12 it says, For we do not fight flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers of, uh, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand. Therefore, having girded your waist with truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you may be able to quench all fiery darts of the wicked one. Those are those seeds that he plants. Do you understand that? Those fiery darts are known his his corruptible seeds that he plants. Then what he does is he speaks. How does he plant them? By his voice. Does everybody get it? Then what he does is he waters them by his voice. 
And the next thing we know, it's growing. Hello. And we say yes, and that spirit enters. Now, it doesn't matter. You know, people are, are so confused about what possession is. You know what? It doesn't matter whether you're possessed, oppressed by a devil. There's a devil present. That's the only thing that matters, right? And it needs to go. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Now, hallelujah. Uh, let's go to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. Everybody all right? A few more scriptures and to God be the glory. But we're going to get good understanding today. Amen. From this day forward, we'll know who told me that. Who told me that? Who am I listening to? Who am I listening to? Who's typing that? That's right. <laughs> Who's typing that before I speak it? Hallelujah. In Matthew 26. <clears throat> In Matthew 26. In verse, uh, let's see here. Matthew 26 and verse 11. Uh, let's start. Let's start at verse eight. But when his disciples saw, no, we better not. We better start at verse six, okay? So we can get this whole story. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, "Why this waste?" They had no idea, did they? They were looking in the natural, weren't they? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Hmm. Assuredly, I say to you, Wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Now listen, what was their problem here? They were concerned about the things of men, weren't they? Here, remember I share with you, God does not interrupt himself. Hello? Wasn't Satan trying to interrupt Jesus from being anointed for his burial? Amen. Hello, do you get it? So what did they do? They yield to the voice of the stranger. Amen? So your flesh can yield to the voice of the stranger, can it? The devil wants to use your flesh. Let me give you an example. You can take dominion over your flesh, can't you? Just like clapping your hands and praising God, lifting your hands to heaven. Yielding. It's a form of yielding, isn't it? The Bible tells us so. So the devil doesn't want you to, does he? That means you're yielding to his voice, aren't you? But you can cause your flesh to yield to God. You can take dominion over it, can't you? Dancing before the Lord, praising and worshiping the Lord. Do you understand? Because we have a choice. The devil does not want you to do the things of God because he does not want you to get in divine position to receive something. Does everybody understand? Amen. Good. Praise be to God. Let's go. I'm going to share another example. This is a powerful example. Turn to John 1. John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, in verse 26. Hallelujah. In John chapter 1, and verse 26. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who, coming, who is coming after me is, prepared, is preferred before me whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethabria, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Now, John saw Jesus, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Who did he hear from by saying, Behold, the Lamb of God, the Holy Spirit? Does everybody understand that? He knew... He said, Behold, the Lamb of God. So he knew he was the Lamb of God, didn't he? He said it in front of all of these people where he was out baptizing, didn't he? Amen? Behold, the Lamb of God. John sees Jesus, the Lamb of God. Now turn to Matthew 11. Hallelujah. Now John heard from the voice of the Lord. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Told it in front of all of these people. Now, I'm going to show you something. In Matthew 11 and verse 1. 
Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his twelve disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison, now where was John? In prison. In prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? What did he do? He sent his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the coming one? Are you the lamb? I, or do we need to look for another? Hello? John was the one that testified and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Now he's in prison. And that, while he was in prison, guess who spoke to him? The voice of the stranger. Now he was questioning. Hello? Doubt came in. Didn't Satan show up to Jesus and say, If you truly are the Son of God? Amen? Amen. Amen. So he's always going to question. He's always going to bring doubt. Amen? Let's turn to Genesis 3. Genesis 3. And Genesis chapter 3. Praise be to God. Is everybody there? Amen. Hallelujah. And Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. Hello? Genesis 3, 1. Is everybody there? Amen. Now the serpent was what? more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Now let me share something with you. When the Lord spoke to Adam, Adam knew that they could not eat of the tree, right? And he spoke to both of them. So now we see that Eve, who is tempted by the serpent, the devil, she says, we can't even touch it. So that means the Lord warned them more than once. Does everybody understand that? He, warned, he said, don't even touch it. Hello? In other words, don't even get near it, lest you what? Die. Now, you know what? The Lord doesn't want us to touch those things in our mind, in our thoughts. Don't touch it. Don't even go to it when it's brought across your path. Don't touch it. So you can teach, touch the things in your mind. Hello? Amen. You can touch those things in the Spirit. And when you touch them, you grab hold of them. And then you begin to entertain that thought. Does everybody understand that? Amen. In verse 4, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. And that's what the devil tells me and you. You're all right, man. You know it all. Man, you know enough. You don't need to go through these teachings. You don't need to sit down and listen to these tapes. You don't need to be submissive to the things. You don't need to read out of the Bible you've been told to read out of. You don't need to do these things. You're all right. Let me tell you something. That's the voice of the stranger. And if he can nail you on that, he can nail you on the rest. It's just a matter of time. For God knows that in that day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, which we know is lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and pride of life. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Is everybody with me? Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering, their own coverings, right? And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now let me share something with you. What did they do? They took the fruit of the tree, partook of it. The first thing that happened to them is they realized that they were naked. Shame came. Consciousness manifested in them. And they hid themselves. Why? Because fear. Did you ever notice that when you're out using, the first thing that comes upon you is fear? And you're hiding. You can put 50 people under a welcome mat. Amen? Come on. This is the same thing that has happened. Eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eating from the accursed items. Partaking of the things of the world and getting fulfillment. Hello? Now, in verse 9. Follow me here. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? Like he didn't know. He was checking him out, wasn't he? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he said to them, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, everybody read this with me, 
Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Do you understand that the Lord said to him, Who told you that? And God is saying to you, Who told you that? Does everybody understand this? You must know. It's your responsibility to know who's speaking to you. It's your responsibility to discern the voice. You discern the voice by its fruits and is it interrupting God. Amen? I want to bring you one more example and then we're going to close. Turn to Acts 5. Hallelujah. Remember, God never interrupts Himself. And you tell Him by the fruits. In Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 5 and verse 1. Who told you that? I mean, if the Lord said that, we need to say that. Amen? In verse 1, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira his wife sold possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds. His wife, also being aware of it, brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, I want you to understand that they were getting together. There was needs of other believers. Widows were needing food and comfort and so forth. And they were putting their possessions together. Amen? Amen. Now, Ananias and Sapphira sold a piece of their property, their land. And they were holding some back. Now, they could have held some back for themselves if they'd have been honest about it. Does everybody understand? Okay. In verse 3, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan, what? Filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourselves. That's all they had to do is say, you know, we've changed our mind. We've decided to do. But what did they do? They lied. And who told him? Who's the father of lies? Satan. So that means that they listened to the voice of the stranger. And we know that. Now look at this was the outcome of, of it. And, and verse 4. And while it remained, was it not your own? In other words, was it not in your own power to do what was right? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control or your own power? To be honest about it. Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to who? God. God. Hello. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down, breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the same thing happened to his wife, because she did not tell the truth when she came in also. Does everybody understand it? Why? Because the wages of sin is death. And that's what the devil wants to do. If, he can, if you will receive his lie, he can convince you to lie. Amen. Now, take the time and determine who is telling you what's going on. Remember, who told you that? It is our choice as to what voice we listen to. The stranger's voice will always come, but the Holy Spirit will guide us if we're hearing what the Spirit is saying. Now, Father, we thank you for your word. We plead the blood of Jesus on this seed. We rebuke the seeds that have been corruptible, that have been parted in us by the powers of darkness and the voice of the stranger. Curse them and command them to wither and die. And we ask, Lord, that your righteous seed will grow and bear fruit for your glory, that you would give us discernment, Lord, to know the voice of the stranger and the voice of you from this day forward in Jesus' name. God bless and know who told you that. And everybody said...